Hi everybody. Um, my name's Oliver Marlow and I'm a designer and I work with a company called Tilt. Um, what I've been asked to speak about today is this, this idea of authorship in architectural design. Um, and one of the things I know about authorship is book writing. So like everyone, most of the people that have stood up today, we've, we've also written a book in the last couple of weeks which has come out, which is very much about our process in terms of co-design, which I'll come on to in, in some detail. As Irina was saying at the beginning, and I think this is a really interesting way to sort of posit what we're talking about today, is this idea of the interregnum, that we're, what we've seen from all the people that have spoken so far, and I think will continue, is that there's people talking about an old paradigm, there's people talking about a new paradigm, and what we find in terms of the different types of sort of topics that people have chosen to go into in depth is this space, this sort of gap between what we know we want and where and how we get there. So for me, it does come down to this idea of what I would call sort of ecology and proximity. And I think, again, it's an urban question. I think there's something that which is inevitable that we, we are living through, not so much in the West anymore, but you know, very much across the rest of the world, is the growth of the city and what comes with that is this idea of proximity, the ecologies of people, the intensity with which people will interact with one another, which will lead to lots of interesting ideas and new developments, but will also come with it all sorts of challenges. Now, talking about, I think, what Jan Gale said this morning, this idea that architecture is an interaction between life and form, I think is a really nice way to put it. And the other thing that I really liked is how he described the kind of bird shit architects. So these architects that do go around the world and just drop a building. So this idea that you can, you can interpret life and form or the interaction of life and form however you want. And if you are one of those star architects, you can interact it simply by saying, I will follow the check as it goes. And I think the thing about the interregnum as we have it and our challenge as designers is that we have to let go of a lot of that. And I mean, specifically, we let go of our authorship. We let go of our ego. and We let go of the architect as the artist. So this idea that the soft issues, as Jan again said them, are not the techn technocratic approach, are actually the key to placemaking. They're the key to designing spaces that have sort of viability and resilience and um, an ongoing sort of value to their, to their residents. So from my point of view, I'm lucky in the fact that I have no architectural training. I um, major in English literature and then also in critical practice of design. What I bring to the design practice um, and the work that I do at Tilt is this idea of criticality. So who are we designing for, why are we designing, and what do we want from design? And I have a practical making through um, various startups that I've been involved with, literal making of, of um, furniture and buildings and also entrepreneurship in terms of business. And I think, again, there's a huge gap between architects and what they make in that actual physicality and tactility of those things, which I think has a huge influence on in how we actually design. So for me, architect, architecture is that sense of design that is context specific. And I think that's, that is the specific challenge to this idea of the Birchard architect, is what, is what is that specific context and how do we understand it? So tilt as a practice is multidisciplinary in the sense that we have architects, graphic designers, communication designers, furniture designers, all of these people working under one roof in a way that lots of practices do. What we do is not necessarily new or, or innovative in that respect. We, we sort of approach things differently in terms of um, our intention. And our intention is about enabling and activating space. And that means that the architecture is about the people. So what we're saying is that you have to transform people's relationship to space in order for the opportunity and the ability to understand all of the things that come from the successes in a place like um, Denmark to some of the challenges that we face in places like um, Bedford Square. So it's that sense of what's possible and what's not, not possible through those thresholds. And what you have to then do is you have to structure this sense that architecture is not necessarily a container anymore. It's not something in which things are placed. It has to remain fluid. It has to remain iterative. It has to remain a conversation. And we have to force it to become a conversation because if we don't, we will get pushed around by anyone who decides to, to stake claim to space. And I think that's a key thing. I think the challenge, though, is that we are speaking different languages. And one of the great examples I like to use is the, is the big court case in Australia between land rights of the Aboriginals and the white settlers. And it was impossible 
for those conversations to um, reach any kind of conclusion, any kind of consensus or understanding because they were speaking different languages. If you have one community that doesn't understand the, even the idea of ownership of land versus a community that's suggesting that if you can, if you can lay claim to the ownership of land then it gives you rights over someone else who's lay, lay claiming, what you can then do is negotiate out and understand you know, where you both fit in. If those languages are separate, it's an impossibility. And you look where Australia is now in terms of those relationships spatially between the Aboriginals and the settlers, and you, you understand how difficult that is. Um, so I think there's something to be said, too, about the designer or the architect, and it goes to this idea that we're all glorified middle, ma middle managers, in some respect, I would argue, that we, we have to work with the grassroots, but we also have to work with the chief execs and the policy makers and the people at the top of the tree, and we have to meet somewhere in the middle. Both of those people have to be happy, I would argue. You have to, you know, you, the client has to be having the sense that someone is paying your bill. And the other, other time, too, is that you have to bring forward all of the insights and you have to meet in the middle and challenge both sides in the sense that creating place, which is effective for all, comes from that challenging position that the designer, if they're willing for this sort of, willing for this sort of fight, is right there. So, some questions. I would like to sort of explore the difference between leadership and authorship because I think um, design processes need leadership even if they're open and inclusive but at the same time I'm not suggesting that that's an authorship in the sense of saying this is mine um, and that then comes down to the ego and the architects it also comes down to this sort of historical precedent around the romantic movement and the artist and the artist sort of vision of, of, of things the second question obviously is very key is what are we building for why are we building I think we should ask that all the time I think there's something about currently what's happening in cities, particularly in the UK, I think, at the moment, is this idea of rationalising and monetarising the sort of gradual urban movement, um, which is generated very sort of iteratively. For my example is the East End here, which has turned from a place of immigrants, poor immigrants, to now a place of rich immigrants, in the sense that they are, they are sort of reframing that. And it reminds me of a cartoon that used to sit in the front foyer of the Whitechapel Gallery, which was... Um, some mills, it's an, a father with his flat cap on in the north holding his son and some mills with some chimneys and the father saying to his son, in the future son, all this will be art galleries. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something really fascinating about understanding what we do with our urban um, legacy. I think another thing too is this sense of growing complexity and ongoing iteration. We looked at that last slide from the last speaker of what complexity looks like when you involve people's relationship to their, their health, their well-being and their, the way they sustain themselves. And I think it is also something that's been realised across so many disciplines. And I think the Higgs, the Higgs particle is one of those examples where, you know, we were happy with the atom, then we were happy with the electron and the neutron, and it keeps going and going and going, and who knows where that's going to stop. But there's someone who's very focused on sort of getting to a point where actually everything is explained. And I think we have to step back and say, it isn't. We have to deal with phenomena, and we have to understand interrelationships more. Um, I think there's a sense that we have to look at planning. Um, if you don't know the work of Robert Moses in New York, and there's some good books about him, he is responsible for New York. He was the person who basically held all of the development through the post-war period of New York to account in the sense that anything that was, anything that was going to get built, he had some kind of hand in it. Um, it's a very, very fascinating story. I think there's something which comes with claiming ownership, sorry, claiming ownership and, and authorship, which we're all happy to do with wonderful buildings, and then also what comes with the resp responsibility of authorship. And I think for me, it's looking at the CCTV tower in Beijing and thinking, you know, do I even care that the person who's gone up to the fifth floor suddenly thinks, well, actually, what I need to be is on that side of the building, and what, you know, how annoying that is. There's a challenge, I think, between theory and practice, something that I asked um, at the very beginning of this, and I think we need to go back to this understanding that theory and practice are, are together. The head and the hands need to be connected. We need to understand and appreciate materiality. We need to understand how we think about things, and we need to bring those things together. We are not um, clerks in that respect. And then the last couple of things to say are, what could an unauthored space look like? So this idea that an unauthored space which is um, organic, it's something like the Central Market in Paris that appeared towards um, the end of the 60s, occupied, uh, you know, and became something entirely different for a small period of time. It connects too to the Occupy movement and some things that we saw from Anna. Things like New York's High Line. You know, what does an unauthorship space look like? Is there, is there sort of a framework that you put in place that allows something to develop organically from those that occupy it? And do you need to 
be sort of strong and disciplined about that framework or you, can you let things just grow organically? And then the last question I think which is, is key is how are non-authors recognised? So the film industry is a good example. You will see the end of the film, you, you know, everyone knows who the directors and all the stars, but then you will see, you know, all of the thousands of people associated with getting that single thing on the screen. From an architecture point of view, we might know who the consultants were, who the planning people were involved. We probably don't know about everyone else. And I think there's something about acknowledging that we aren't just those authors. And if we find ways to introduce and also to, to credit those authors, whether it's from a co-housing point of view, whether it's even from a co-working point of view, it becomes a key ingredient to giving people ownership, not necessarily fiscal ownership, but an ownership of space which means that they care about it, and in which case they will fight for it. And that becomes then a very interesting argument. So thank you very much. Thank you.